Hello, First Baptist. Hope this finds all of you well. Coming to you today from the makeshift office where I have been spending a lot of time here these last several weeks. I want to come to you today with a word of encouragement about the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God is something that we have seen in our study of Daniel that we have been working through on Sundays. Daniel came to recognize and embrace the sovereignty of God in spite all of the difficult circumstances in his life. He knew that what happened in his life had come to him through the hand of God and that there was this understanding that I, I, I can't change what's happened here. This is God's sovereign plan and purpose for my life. Now that doesn't mean that Daniel didn't pray. Um, Daniel certainly of all people was a man of prayer, but he recognized the firm hand of God's sovereignty in his life. We know he recognized it because he, he talked about it. In chapter 2, when he prays to God, he recognizes that God is the one who sets up kings and takes them down, and God is the one that takes us from one season to the next, and God is the cause behind all of those things, and he's in control of all of those things. And there's a sense in which we're not going to change the sovereignty of God. It is what it is. And we embrace it. And like I said, that doesn't mean we don't pray. We are called on to pray, and, and we do. But we have to recognize God's sovereignty. Charles Spurgeon wrote about this embracing of God's sovereignty when, when he said, The Lord, ever merciful, has appointed every moment of sorrow and every pang of suffering. If he orders the number 10, it can never rise to 11. Nor should you desire that it shrink to 9. The Lord's time is best. The span of your life is measured to a hair's width. Restless soul, God ordains all. So let the Lord have his way. In other words, embrace God's perfect, beautiful sovereignty. He's always working for our good. But I, I think where my mind has been challenged this week is it's not sufficient for us to embrace God's sovereignty. As with any other doctrine, that doctrine must lead to doxology. It, it is good to recognize and embrace God's sovereignty, but it needs to lead us to praise. It can't just be, oh, that this is what God has and there's, there's nothing I can do about it. And kind of this dour, depressed attitude. No, a recognizing and embracing of God's sovereignty should lead us to praise. It should lead us to praise. The Apostle Paul is a great example of this. He, he writes about all of this wonderful doctrine of God in the first 11 chapters of Romans. He writes about God's sovereignty in salvation. He writes about the love of Christ and that nothing will separate us from that love. Even if we are in hardship and trial and in peril, we can never be separated from that. And when Paul gets to the end of chapter 11, he bursts out in praise and says, Of you and through you and to you, God, are all things, and to you belongs glory forevermore. That is doctrine that leads to doxology. And an embracing of sovereignty should lead to praise. John Piper spoke to this in a, in a quote that I found this week. And Piper said, The only person who does justice to the sovereignty of God is the person who sings about it. Watch out for the person who wants to talk about the sovereignty of God, but has no song in his heart. The biblical opposite of pride is not pondering the sovereignty of God, but praising the sovereignty of God, delighting in it, resting in it. Friend, if we truly believe that God is working all things together for our good, and as believers, we do believe that, then we can not only embrace the sovereignty of God, we can rejoice in it. We can sing about it. Even in the midst of hardship, we can sing a song of praise. So let us be those who both hold to doctrine 
and rejoice in the truth that that doctrine reveals about the God who loves us so much. Thank you, brothers and sisters. God be with you till we meet again.